Romine, how many commercials have you done? Let's see. It's been about 275 now. Oh, you have the exact count? No, not exact. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's about, about. That. Okay. Yeah. And in what span of time? Since uh, 1984. Oh, good year. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> My first commercial was, um, well, my first national was 1984. And um, I did a commercial with James Brown, the godfather of soul. You know, ow, James Brown. I did that commercial with him and when we introduced Chicken McNuggets. They had just come out and we did one of the first commercials for Chicken McNuggets. And uh, I was in Chicago and uh, that's where I was living at the time. And uh, that was uh, my big shot, you know, because I hadn't done anything. Like in Michigan, where I was from, I had done a, a local business school commercial that was really nothing. So that I didn't count that. But I did the McDonald's in 1984. And um, I was like so excited. And I was saying, I can't be this lucky. And of course, he showed up like four hours late. So I'm sitting there and I'm like worried. I'm like, oh man, I knew this was gonna happen. So he shows up and they have everything set up, the lights, you know, the cameras, everything. And they say to him, the director, whose name was Sid Myers, who was the top commercial director at that point. He said, uh, well, I'm glad you're here, James. Could you go stand on your mark? He says, I thought I told y'all to call me Mr. Brown. I'm like, oh. So he immediately went and sat down on one of the little chairs at McDonald's, you know the little chairs, and he wouldn't do anything. So the um, art director from the ad agency came over, the director begged him, and the copywriter, everybody from the ad agency came over to try to get him to work. So I'm like saying, wait a minute. This is a national commercial. This is my first big break. And I had been living in Chicago for a few months and I had no money and I was like doing survival work. I, I like uh, was a painter and plaster because as, I, as a teenager, a man in my neighborhood was a contractor who owned a painting and plastering company. So during the summer, he would bring all the kids in and teach us how to paint and do that. And we got paid, you know, a little money. And so I knew that kind of trade. So I got a job doing that. And so that was basically what I was doing. But I mean, I was there to try to become an actor and whatnot. So um, I said, well, I see this is not going to go well. So I went over to Mr. Brown. And he has his two big bodyguards standing behind him. And they looked at me. I'm like, oh, no, no just, I just want to ask him a question. I said, excuse me, Godfather. He says, uh, what? I said, uh, could you please, you know, help us? You know, this is like my, my first big commercial. I just moved here a few months ago. And all of us, you know, we're trying to make it like you. You know, we're trying to get, get ourselves going and everything. He said, well, I ain't doing nothing. Everybody always want me to do a damn shuffle. I ain't shuffling yet. And, you know, he started talking like that. So then I was like, oh. So then I turned to walk away and then I came back. I said, aren't you the godfather of soul? He said, oh, brother, come on. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. I say, you sold brother number one. I said, when I was a little kid and we'd have parties, we couldn't get the girls to dance with us until we put on one of your records, which was really true. And the girls would dance with us, because you know little girls don't like little boys and whatnot, and the boys are like, okay, I gotta dance. So when you put his stuff on, everybody get up and dance. He said, really? I said, yeah. I said, come on, Godfather. So by this time, the other actors picked up on what I was doing. They said, Godfather, Godfather, Godfather. And his bodyguards at this point are standing back there kind of laughing, you know. So he turned around and said, y'all quit laughing. So, so he said, all right, all right, all right, ease up. I'll do it. Typical James Brown, like, you know, how they put the cape on him or anything. Once he started doing his little dance and all that shuffle and all that stuff, they couldn't stop him. He said, get this. And the director said, uh, Keep the camera rolling. So they shot all of this stuff. But the interesting thing about the whole shoot was the fact that after every take, his wife, who was like his stylist, would come out and 
fluff and comb his hair after every take. So you can imagine we're doing like a hundred takes. She comes out. And the thing is, what was so funny is, she had on this tight black dress like Morticia Adams. And she would come out like that. And we'd be standing there like, okay. And she would come out and do his hair. Because you know he had that hair, you know. And she'd do that. And then she'd do a little walk off each take. So it got to the point where we were there all day. And so at that point, I didn't really understand the money aspect about you want to stay on the shoot as long as you can. You want to get in there over eight, nine hours because then you go into overtime. You get into time and a half, double time, triple time. So we were there like 14 hours. So I was like, man, I'm tired. And once I got to check, I realized that I made more in overtime than I made for the actual session fee. So that was my first experience. So after that, I was like, I want to stay on these things as long as I can. I mean, I'll wear myself out, but you get paid. So after the commercial, after we shot it, I said, well, thank you. He came up and said, yeah, thank you. I, I've been a little upset with these people. I said, oh, yeah, okay, I can imagine. So I said, is there any way I can get a signed picture for my niece? He gave me a signed picture, and he's really nice after that. So that was my first commercial I did, you know, many years ago. And have you ever tried to approach quote unquote, this like A-level talent like that ever again? Or was, was that something being green and just being human with him, it just happened in that one moment? Well, no, I had never, I haven't done that since then because I haven't really had a reason to do that. But that was a situation where I'm, I'm, I'm you know, new in town and I'm staying with an uncle of mine and his family and he got these little kids that were just bad, you know, like little kids, you know, and I'm like, oh, I gotta get out of here. So I needed to get some money so I can get my own place. But I was thankful of my, my, my mother's youngest brother, of course. I was thankful for them to let me stay with them while I was trying to get my feet wet. But no, I had never done that. I mean, since then, I've worked with a lot of, a lot of big people. And I know actor and I know protocol. You don't, you don't say anything to these people, approach them or anything. But I really, like, I really didn't know any better, but I just came up to them because I was like, and the funny thing is the ad agency said to me after that, the people from the ad agency said, we're not going to forget you for this. Thank you so much. And you know, you hear that all the time. Like, yeah, all right, whatever. A month later, it's like about 150 degrees because we shot that commercial in the summertime. And in Chicago, like the Midwest, when it's July and August, it's unbearable. The humidity is crazy. So about a month later in August, I'm in Chicago at my uncle's house, you know, and I'm just, you know, doing stuff around the house, you know, helping clean up the mess of the kids, you know, because they all in school. I'm by myself there. And I get a call, and my agent is like, oh, I'm glad I caught you. I said, oh, what's going on? You got to get downtown right away. I'm like, what? They say, you got to get down to, the, to Beth Rabador to the casting agency. You got to get there. They need to see you. I'm like, oh, so I get my stuff together. And I don't have a car, so I get on, a, get on a bus, get over to the train, which is the Dan Ryan, which is the train. And I catch the train down there. I get into place. I open the door, and the casting director runs up. And I mean, I'm sweating like a pig. She, she comes up. She's, oh. I said, what's going on? She says, they need to see you in there right away. So I walk in this room, and it's all of those people that were on the McDonald's shoot. And the art director, he says, we told you we weren't going to forget you. And the commercial turned out to be Crest Toothpaste. And it was uh, an award-winning spot where we lost the Clio, which is like the top, it's like the Oscars of commercials. We lost that commercial award to Where's the Beef? Remember the Claire Peller at Wendy's? That, that won everything. But we came in second to that. And after that, I started doing all kind of stuff after that. Oh, for that company? For, for that all the companies. Oh, I, wow. I mean, I just started. Because, see, the funny thing is about, like, commercials, once the, once the people see you, like other ad agencies or other products, once they see you, they, they'll call you in or they tend to want to use you because the thing is, you know, in our business, nobody wants to really take a chance on anybody. So, you know, when somebody takes a chance on you, then other people say, oh, well, they took a chance on him, so... Yeah, 
It's like dating, you know. You know, most women don't want you if no other woman don't want you. <laughs> it's just how that is, you know. So I started doing a lot of commercial stuff, and then I started doing plays. And Chicago's a theater town, you know. It's like um, it's like the second theater town. And then I studied at Second City, you know. I studied, um, and I, I got to meet um, Bill Murray. Bill Murray's brother, Joel, was in my class, you know, when I was studying at Second City. So Bill Murray would come into town from Saturday Night Live, and he would take us all to to dinner and everything because he's you know he's rich. So he would take us all because his little brother was in our class, and he would have us. He would entertain us and everything. He was just as funny as he could be. Now he's gotten a little jaded over the years. I mean, you know, he's got a little different, but 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 he was really nice. I mean, he's still cool from what I'm hearing. But uh, you know, I met him. I met um, at the time Belushi was alive, John Belushi. I met all of them because they would all come back to town, and they would all go work out at at Second City. You know, work on stuff and play around and, you know, hang out and stuff. So I got to meet a lot of people like that. And I studied improv over there for a couple of years. And my big regret is that I didn't go on road on the road. They wanted me to go on the road with one of the touring companies. But I was doing at that point so well commercially on camera commercials and voiceover that it was hard for me to leave that money. And I regret it to this day because one of the guy a couple of the guys that when in my place end up becoming, you know, stars off of that. You know, I was like, Ugh. but you know, hey, it's, you, you, you make choices, you know. How is commercial work different from other types of acting? It depends, you know, it depends on what type of commercial it is. I mean, you have commercials where you have, um, it'll be a, a serious, you know, commercial dealing with, uh, uh, say drug use or whatever, or maybe teen pregnancy or whatever, you know, and them, they might gear the commercial to look more like a TV or a film. Okay, then you have commercial auditions where it's really broad and high comedy like sitcom. I've done all different types of commercials over the years where they might have me do a sitcom type commercial, you know, or they might have me do something like a more dramatic commercial where you have to really act or be able to pull that off. But the more versatile you are, of course, the more money you make and the more opportunities you get. What usually happens in a commercial audition, Romain? Uh, <clears throat> well, let me say this. Since uh, the pandemic, um, things have pretty much changed as far as the auditioning process. You do more self-tape type auditions now. People like me that have been doing it for a long time prefer to be in the actual agency with the casting people as, and possibly the clients. Because, see, I have a theater background, so I still like to perform and be in front of those folk. But when you self-tape, you pretty much they give you the specs of what they want, and you pretty much have to try to interpret what they want from the specs. So you really don't know necessarily what they want. Now, if you're fortunate to get a call back and it's still, you know, self or, or like on Zoom or something, then, you know, you know, you, you're interacting with them. So you get a little more feedback or you actually get a lot of feedback as far as what they want. But I tend to um, I tend to book more when I go into the agency more because um, it's just part of being like on, on stage for me, you know. And a lot of actors, a lot of actors prefer to do self tapes because they don't feel comfortable being in the room. I do because I'm I'm a ham. <laughs> and you think that that maybe you would book more because they pick up on all the little improv oh, all and nuances. Of that. All that, of that. All okay. of that. And then when I come in the room, and and I and and I tell people. Um, when they when they go for a commercial uh, audition in person, I tell people I said, "How you come in the room and whatnot? Those first couple of 10, 20, 30 seconds when you walk in, a lot of times they deter that determines whether you might get the job or whether you know they might like you or not." What is it? What do you think it is? It's just like eye contact or just seeing your body language? All of that. Now, I've been in situations where I've walked in the room and the people hated me. 
And you pick, you know, you, you could pick up on stuff. And I'm like, okay, they don't like me. <laughs> I mean, for whatever reason. And it could be any reason. I was in a situation before where um, uh, a guy was saying that he booked a job because the, uh, the, the woman from the ad agency had a, a boyfriend that looked like him in high school, you know. And then I've been in situations where I've been in the room where I thought they didn't like me, where I'm just like, oh boy, I'm not getting anything from them, you know, as far as any feedback or any warmth. And I leave there and, you know, on the way home or whatever, I'm driving and my agent will say, they want to put you on a veil. I'm like, a veil for what? For where you just left. <laughs> and then an hour or two later, they'll call my agent and say, you booked it. I'm like, uh, okay. And then when you get on the shoot, those same people that were like, come up to you, oh, we're so glad to have you here. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, okay. Then on the other hand, I've been in a room where, I've had the people just like gushing on me. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Nothing. So it's hard to say. It's, it's just so crazy about how the business is. And, um, and, and, and you know, you just got to just play it by ear. You got to play it by ear. But commercials now, commercials now are, are um, pretty much, most of them are now real people type commercials. And they don't do more, they don't do as many serious, dramatic commercials, unless the subject calls for it. But if you notice from TV, everything is usually kind of, you know, funny and kind of, you know, and whatnot. Because especially over the last couple of years, we've, we've, we've needed to have people laugh, you know, and be entertained and feel better, you know, about themselves. And about the world. Yes. <laughs> mainly Not the world. Not just themselves, yeah. Yeah, mainly the world. <laughs> We all feel good about ourselves. Right. I feel good about me. <laughs> what are some do's and don'ts of commercial auditions? Even, even when you're in the car checking your hair or whatever, checking your teeth, what are some things that you just know don't do this and make sure to do this? Okay, well, at an audition, when you uh, come in the room, don't, don't try to, you know, befriend people or to especially on a callback situation, you know. Now, when you go in for the first audition, usually in person, you're in there with a casting person or the director, casting director or assistant, and I know everybody. So, you know, we'll talk about, hey, did you see the game or blah, 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 and whatever, and then they say, okay, you ready? We'll tape it. Then I'll leave out, because I know the people. Coming to the callback, unless I know the director, and I know quite a few of them, I still don't, glad hand and hey how you doing buddy I don't know I don't do that I say hey hi how are you you know and the directors usually when they know me say hey good to see you man and what now I say hey, well thank you you know I'm, I'm a little more humble like that and then I try not to um, I try not to play to the crowd I try to really get focused on the director because the director is the person that is going to give you whatever direction and feedback you need. And I've done it, of course, but sometimes you, you might want to play to the people in the room because they might be laughing and whatnot. And you, you know, you know, you got an audience, so that's not, you shouldn't do that. You should just mainly stay with the director. And a lot of times actors are afraid to ask questions because most actors are afraid to either come off like they don't know anything or like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm imposing on them. No, when you're in that room, that's your audition. And like when a director says something to me, if I don't understand what they're saying, I'll say, excuse me, I, I didn't understand. Could you say that again? You want me to do such and such and this and that? And they'll say what they want. And also what that does is, psychologically, these are secrets here I'm giving everybody, by the way. <laughs> psychologically, what it does is, it makes you have a relationship with that director because you, 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 you're going beyond what the script of the commercial is. He's giving you specific instructions about he want. you say, what he wants. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. And then if you're able to execute it at that point, then that's a plus, you know, in, in your favor, you know. So, and another thing, 
don't please don't linger after your audition. Once you finish your audition, don't stay in there and, you know, they say, well, hey, you know, uh, I'm glad you had me here. And no, no. Once you're finished, say thank you, leave. Because sometimes, see, you could talk your way into a job and you can talk your way out of it. And I've done that before. I've done it. Because <laughs> you're human. Sometimes you do that. And when I've left, I said, why were you talking so much in there? I say that to myself. Then some of them I've gotten and some of them I haven't. But you got to know when to, you got to know when to leave. You got to know when to give yourself that hook and get out of there. You know, you got to know. And when you're on the shoot, as a matter of fact, when you're on the shoot, always, and I'd say this to young inexperienced or just basically inexperienced actors, always say thank you to your clients when you're done. No matter what they're doing, what well, they could be talking to the director or talking to whoever. Once you're done shooting and they would say, okay, that's a wrap. And they say, hey, thank you, whatever. Always go to your clients and say, thank you. You could interrupt them no matter what they're doing is protocol. And they will stop talking about whatever. And, oh, and you know, shake hands and thank you so much. Hey, it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Hey, thank you. Get it out of there. Leave. Of course, you always have to say thank you to your director and you have to say thank you to your camera operator and all of the crew. But see, I've been doing it so long. I know most of these people. Like yesterday, I did a I did the job for some people, uh, the director and his company. I worked for a few months ago. So everybody knew me, you know, and I know I've known those guys, a few of them for years. So I'll say, hey, good to see you. How's, the, how's your daughter? How's your kids doing? Whatever. And like that. And then one thing I do, like I didn't shoot my scene until the end of the day yesterday. So when they broke for lunch, they say, okay, actors and whatnot, you know, get served first. I hadn't shot anything. So the crew is supposed to wait. I said, oh, no. And when I got, I stood there, they said, oh, go ahead. I said, no, no, you go ahead. I haven't done anything yet. And the crew is like, wow. I said, no, no, I insist. You go ahead. And I was one of the last ones to eat because I hadn't done anything. I've been sitting around all day. They like that. The, the, the directors and the crew people, they like that because you let them know that you are not better than them. You are part of them. See, we're a team. See, but now if I'm working, the reason they want us to go first is because we have to get ready. They have to, you know, remake us up or change outfits or whatever. So you go first. OK, it's understandable. But in my situation, I was sitting around like this. I don't know, you go. And they, they really appreciate that. They might not say it to you, but it's little things like that when you get on a set when, when, that they remember. Now, what about when you're sitting in the, the waiting room? Let's suppose it is an in-person audition and there's other actors there. Are you talking to them? Are you telling them about a commercial you just booked? What's the protocol? It depends. It depends on it depends on the um, the people you're talking to. Or I tend to I tend to not talk too much. You know about it. It's like we were talking about Facebook earlier. I don't really talk much about what I do on Facebook about the jobs I book. I talk about other things like sports. <laughs> they even know about my sports. <laughs> and I talk a little political stuff. You know. And people say, you don't talk about anything you do. I said, no, I don't do that for some reason. But I've never been the type of person that has done that because it's like, eh, you know. I come, from a, I come from a sports background where it's like um, I was always taught if you score a touchdown, you don't have to do the dance and everything. You have to act like, you know, you already do that and it's something that you already always do and, you know, you're familiar doing. So I tend to, you know. Like, you know, just kind of flip the ball. I didn't flip it much when I played, but I tend to just hand the ball off and go back to the side. I'm kind of like that as far as the business. When something about me is posted on Facebook as far as work, I'm not the one that put it on there. I have friends that say, you know, you need to put that on there. I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that, mainly because I don't know how. And second of all, I just don't do that. So I tend to, you know, kind of, you know, lay back on that, you know. I mean, what if you give an audition and it's not the audition you wanted to give? Maybe the performance you wanted to give, maybe you didn't like the direction and you felt it didn't 
showcase your talents? Well, that happens. Nothing with... If you can't redo it, then... <laughs> I mean, you got... You know, come on, you got days where you're going to be on. And you have days where you're going to be off. And if you have a track record as far as being a reliable, competent actor, casting people know from, from having worked with you or know from the from experience of seeing your work or knowing you, they know when you're on because you have those days. I mean, like anything, on any job. Some days you don't feel like going to work and you have to go and then you figure out a way not to do anything, you know, like I used to do in corporate America, which I got out of there quickly. But uh, you, you, you have days where you, you on and days when you're off. And then there's points where you say, okay, unless I can redo the audition, then you know, you have to just deal with it. But you wanna try to be, um, you wanna try to be grounded in whatever you do. And that's basically from, you know, knowing your, your technique and also from practice and study. And I always, I always tell people that it doesn't matter how long or how, how long you've been in the business or how good you think you are, you always have to practice and you always need to workshop and take classes and whatnot because there's always something new and you don't know everything. You might think you do, but sometimes you have off days and sometimes you have to just accept that, okay, I didn't do it that day. See, where, where a lot of people have problems in this business is when they get themselves worked up over the fact that they didn't do exactly what they wanted and they carry it into another audition or they carry it into somewhere else and, you know, they don't treat their dog right or, you know, <laughs> or their significant other because of that. And that's really ridiculous, you know. And when I first got into business, I, um, my, my first teacher who was like my mentor at that point I went to an audition and I didn't do what I wanted and I left out and I was almost in tears and I was, and I called him up and I said, it didn't go well. He says, okay, why are you, why are you upset like this? He says, because it didn't, he says, do you honestly think you're going to do every audition and it's going to be great? And then he told me, he says, you know, no matter what you do, 99% of them you're not going to get anyway. And I said, huh? He says, most of the stuff you're not going to get, so why trip out and worry about it? Just go in, do the best you can at that point and at that time, and let it go. Now, of course, it's, nobody lets it go. But over the years, what I've done is I've been able to let it go a lot sooner. <laughs> See, so you can't worry about stuff like that. You just have to go head on and do your best and just, you know, roll the dice and let it go. Do a lot of actors have negative views about doing commercial work now? No. Back then, you couldn't get a star to even think about doing a commercial. They, that was an insult. And even when stars did commercials, they would like go over to Japan and places or Europe where they got paid millions of dollars. <clears throat> like, you know, Paul Newman did that. He, you know, Paul Newman's a fantastic actor. He did a lot of commercials in Asia and in Japan and Europe. And the star, big stars would do that. Now, they get, most, they get most of the commercials now. And they get paid major dollars. The rest of us, they start to cut our money, you know. You know, it's, it's kind of gone down for the regular working actor, you know, as far as the, the amounts of money. Are these buyouts, by the way? I'm not sure exactly how it is for the stars. They might buy them out, I'm not really sure. I'm pretty sure they do, because the money is so huge that it would, it would offset any kind of session fee or a use fee or something. Like for us, you got a session fee and then a use fee. So I don't know, I think they might be a kind of a buyout with the stars, because, but it's so far over scale that they can do that, you know. And is it different for internet versus TV versus radio? Oh yeah, well, internet now, <laughs> now you get like a flat rate for the internet, you know. Whereas before, you know, they would pay you uh, a certain amount every 13 weeks. Now it's a little different, you know. And then the, uh, like a lot of people say, oh, you, you got paid for every time it runs. That's not the case too much anymore. 
See, that was considered network. But the problem with network now is most people don't watch network television. Most people are streaming. So now we're getting screwed on those streaming contracts like Netflix and Hulu and all those when they show commercials. They give you a flat rate and that's it. If an actor doesn't have an agent, can they still find commercial auditions? They can uh, because um, a lot of the uh, like, like uh, backstage uh, and casting network and some of those sites, you know, they, they have auditions, open call for auditions. But usually it's, it's like going through agents and casting directors who deal with agents. <clears throat> so it's kind of tight on that, but it's, there, there are opportunities, you know. What's your final advice to actors who want to do commercial work? Any, any parting words? Well, uh, I'll say that um, it beats having a regular job <laughs> because you then, you know, can focus on other things, you know. If you're able to get, get jobs and, you know, work, you know. I mean, I haven't, I haven't had a regular job in many years. In parting, I would say commercial work is, is really almost like the bread and butter now for, for most actors because the theatrical and TV work is, is much less than it was for non-stars and whatnot. Because as we know in the... Um, theatrical business, you know, in films and, and whatnot, they tend to skew younger. So a lot of the older actors that were like doing a lot of films and whatnot, they have moved back to TV and also into commercials. Because see, like I said, commercials no longer have that stigma of being low rent and beneath somebody because it's so lucrative. And if you notice on TV, you see more stars doing commercials Athletes, you know, and whatnot, they're getting all of, all of the work. And regular folk are not getting as much work now, you know, because everything is, is moving towards that. I mean, you got like um, uh, 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 Jennifer Aniston doing, you know, cosmetic commercials. I mean, I just saw J-Lo last night doing a, a commercial at a health club where she was talking about something, and it was for some product, you know. And these are, these are A-list mega stars. And they're doing commercials because it's easy work for them as far as not as much time. The work is not easy as, as, as easy as people think, but it's, it's, it's easier as far as on your schedule and, on, and on, on your time. As opposed to like, say Demi Moore might get a million dollars for an AT&T commercial and she might make a million dollars say doing a film but she's on set for like, what, two weeks or three weeks, you know, as opposed to doing, you know, a commercial for eight hours. And most stars don't even stay that long. They leave, they're like, oh, I, I have to go. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Because everybody defers to them and a lot of the uh, advertising people want to become auteurs and become, you know, film people. So they tend to want to say, hey, look, can you ch check my script out? And the stars say, oh, sure, give it here. They don't do anything with it. What does it mean to you to be an artist? Oh, wow. Uh, it, it means that um, I'm able to, to give something back to people and to hopefully enlighten someone, you know, uh, and, and help someone understand something, whatever it is, I mean, and plus, me being an artist is basically all I can do anyway. So, so I mean, that's just who I, who I am, you know. And I tell people, I say, if, if you're going to be an actor, you can't go into it wanting to become a star. You can't go into it and uh, put a time limit on it. I mean, years ago, I knew people that um, got into it and they were like saying, especially when they moved out here to California, they were like, well, if I don't have a TV show by, you know, the, by, uh, in another year, I'm going back to Kansas. It's like, uh, okay, you better go back to Kansas. <laughs> you can't put a time limit. This is a life. This is, this is a life. You know, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have more downs than ups. And I find that people that 
and I can't say, and I don't want to say all people, but I find that a lot of people that were stars in college or whatever as actors in their universities, a lot of them tend to have a harder time because they, um, they've been spoiled to a certain point. And, and once they get into the real world of acting, they realize they're just one of the numbers. And see, by me not majoring in being in college like this as of that, it was easy for me to roll with the punches on it. I mean, I did this as a kid, you know. You know, I did plays and I, all of the little stuff, played piano, all that kind of stuff as a kid. But I left it and went into sports. So having had a sports background, I know like that thing I said about you're not going to win everything, you know, because in sports you're not going to win everything. So you, turn, you tend to have a little more of an even keel about it. And I find that a lot of my friends that, in, that I went to college with that were like in the theater department and had a, a degree as a director in, in film are, you know, telemarketers and, and not in the business. There's nothing wrong with those jobs, of course, you know, but they tend not to make it like that. And it was funny because a lot of those folk, I came into it from somewhere else. I came into it, you know, uh, just basically from the sports and being just a, 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 a loafer in college. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I wasn't really great in college because I was like, I got pretty good grades towards the end, but my first couple of years, I was like, oh, okay, I was clowning around and everything, you know. And I didn't get serious until it was time to get out of there, you know. But, but most people tend to, you know, when they come from a theater background or whatever, they tend to have a hard time because they have a certain expectation. And this industry does not care. Once you get in this business, they don't care. I mean, it's nice to have a, 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 a master's from Yale, you know, drama school. I mean, you might have a, con it's all connections and whatnot anyway. So you might be able to do some things, but if it's just based upon, you know, I have studied here at Juilliard's, you know, and uh, no, no. You got to get, once you get in front of that camera or get on that stage, you either have it or you don't. Yeah, I think early rejection actually helps you. Because also, too, it's not just um, the degree, but let's suppose you were a big fish back in your little pond or you were the family star and everyone you know, thought you were, oh, we can't wait to see little Joey go off and he's going to make it. And <laughs> then I think that spoils people. And yeah. this is not that kind of a town. Uh -uh. It, it sets you up almost. Well, yeah, because, see, you get spoiled because, like you say, you were a big fish in a small pond. Now you're a small fish in the biggest pond. So, you know, it, it all weighs out differently, you know. So you have to, it, it all depends on the type of person you are. It all gets back to what type of person you are, how you are inside. It all gets back to that. And um, like I said, I, I have friends that were like really, really, really top notch in school, in this business, and, and nowhere to be found. And uh, matter of fact, I, I ran into a guy a few years back who I went to high school with who was the star of everything in high school. And he said to me, he says, wow, I, I can't believe that you've been doing this all these many years and, and uh, I, was the, I was the top actor in high school. I'm like, yeah, you were. That's all I could say was, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you ran into him here in Los Angeles? No, I ran into him back in Michigan, you know, back home. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, I, I, I said, yeah you, yeah, you really were good. Yeah, yeah, you were excellent. What makes artists different than other people? Well, different in the sense of uh, what you do, but not necessarily, you shouldn't be different as far as the type of person you are. It's, the difference is basically what you do. Being an artist, being an, uh, whether you're a sculptor or a painter or a, a, a musician or an actor or a dancer or whatever, the only difference is what you do. It shouldn't be the type of person you are. 
See, see where people have a problem in our business is once they get in it, they tend to, uh, not all people, but some people, they tend to let it overwhelm them as far as their sense of who they are and how important they are. And my thing has always been, eh, you just it's a job, you know? Because, like I said, I couldn't do anything else. I got fired from every regular job I've ever had. I got fired from my paper route when I was 12. And it started a long list of being fired from regular jobs. Once I got in this, it was different. Now I got fired once in this, but I won't get into that. <laughs> but, but you know, it's just you gotta be you gotta be a regular person. And and I find that um, being a regular person, people in the industry like you for that. I don't have many people that don't like me because I, it's hard for, not to like me because I'm just a regular guy. I don't, I'm not pretentious or anything like that. I don't, you know, well, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm who I am. No, I'm not that because I'm not that. You know, I'm just a regular working actor, you know. So I understand. I mean, I had a woman tell me years ago when I first got into business, she said, yes, I saw you uh, in that uh, little thing you did. I'm, I'm surprised that you were able to do that. I'm like, uh, I beg your pardon? She says, well... I, uh, I had a scholarship in New York with Alvin Ailey, which is top dance company. You know, I said, oh yeah, that's great. She says, so if I couldn't make it, what makes you think you could make it? Yeah, she said that to me. <laughs> now, I was at a point where I was new in the business and I was like, oh, okay. And you know, it, it, I still remember that, you know, and I'm like, oh. And I'm sure that woman has seen me over the years, you know. She might be seeing you now. She might. And uh, my first agent I got in Detroit, she handed me a script. She says, read this. So it was a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial or whatever. And, you know, I had no real experience as far as an actor like that, so I read it. She says, you have a great look. Oh, beautiful smile. You really, personality is great. But you'll never do voiceover work. And I said, oh, okay. And I was like, first of all, I'm like, voiceover work, basically, what's that? <laughs> and, and once it was explained to me, I said, oh, okay. So I'm like, well, why won't I be doing that? That's what I thought to myself. So how fate and how God and everything works, I moved into an, a, an apartment building where one of the guys that lived in the building was a recording engineer at a, at a studio. And I was in the laundry room one day, and he came in with his laundry, and we got to talking. He says, uh, yeah, Gerald said that you, uh, you, you're into the acting thing. I said, well, I'm just starting out in it. He says, oh, do you do voiceover? I says, no, uh, my agent told me that I probably wouldn't be able to do that. He says, why not? So he says, let me put a load of clothes on. Come up to my, come up to my apartment. Go to his apartment. Got a studio. He started teaching me how to do voiceover. So when I left Detroit and moved to Chicago, I had my first little demo tape. The agents heard it and says, this is pretty good. Now I had to gain more experience as I went along, but that's how I got into that. Because somehow, you know, God, the, the, the voiceover gods were like, how dare her say he, he, she, he will never do that. We determined this, you know. So it just fell into place, you know. I've been doing voiceovers ever since. Matter of fact, I gotta go and do something later. I gotta do some auditions, you know. I get three or four a day, which is a lot of auditions. Voiceover auditions, you get three or four a day minimum. And I mean, it's hard work to get, but it's very lucrative. In fact, I just did two last actual jobs last week. So, but you know, that's how it is, you know. So it's, it's, the business is crazy like that, you know. People tell you stuff and then, you know, your agents will say, okay, hey, I can't do this, you, you can't do this, you can't do that, and you're like, oh. Nobody likes to have somebody tell them what they can't do, especially if they haven't never done it before, or haven't tried it, it's like, okay. Because at that point, you know, all of the voiceover actors were still sounding like this, they, you know, those commercials back then. Now they don't want that. And since the pandemic, they want real. 
They want real. If you notice the commercials and everything and the voice over stuff, it's like people talking, you know, during the pandemic, it was really rough for me. And, and I think I, I was able to, you know, go and get everything taken care of and my medication is okay. As opposed to years ago, Tylenol medication, the medicine that will help you get over your headache. You know, years ago, it's like, it's all changed. So they want real people. So I was, a re I was one of the first of the real people, voiceover people. I was, one of the, I was one of the first black guys to be a real person in a, in a voiceover audition or in a job. I was one of the first ones. Well, you could do both, though. That you could do oh, the, oh, yeah. the 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 oh, yeah. stage so, voice. Well, sometimes I mean, like like yesterday, last night, as a matter of fact, when I got home, I had to do one for um, I forgot what uh, I'm not supposed to say the product, so I better not. But I had to be like um, new Don Pardo. Here we go. You know that whole thing. New on the Price Is Right. That kind of thing. I can do that stuff. You know, but you don't do a lot of that stuff. And then they tend to go with those regular guys that do that, you know. And most of us are like, I mean, I have friends say, I didn't get that. I said, well, they went with the real person for that. I mean, you know, the real guy from, you know, uh, Price is the Right or whatever, you know. It's no problem with that. You say, okay. But when it's like regular stuff, that's us, you know. I tend to get people wanting me to do um, James Earl Jones. We we're looking for a James Earl Jones type. We're looking for Ving Rhames, you know, who does... Uh, uh, Arby's, we, we've got the meats. And you know, they'll say, we're looking for something like that. And I noticed that whenever I try to sound like those people, I don't get that stuff. So lately what I've been doing is, I've been saying, this is good for the voiceover folk. folk. Lately I've been saying, you know what? I'm going to sound like me. So instead of Arby's, you like Arby's, hey, great, you know, come get a burger. I mean, whatever. I book those because you be yourself. You're not trying to sound like, Morgan Freeman, no, it's Morgan Freeman. You know, I get all of that kind of stuff. And I, and I finally understood that, of course, they don't want that actual sound. They want that kind of flavor. You know, they want that kind of persona or whatever. So that's what you kind of get into after a while. But this is, a, lot of like, a lot of stuff like that you don't learn in school. You don't learn that stuff in school. You got to learn it out here. You got to learn it out here in the real world and where people come out of college and out of school and they say, oh, well, I'm going to do this. Then they get out here and like, wow, because there are people out here been doing this a long time and they're not going anywhere. Well, me, we're going to show you some random characters and we want you to give us your take on who you think the character is, what they would sound like, what they would be like. Uh, so the first one is this person here. Do you know this character? I know who that is. You know who it is, okay. How would you start to build this character? Well, first of all, by looking at him and how his expression is, I would figure that, okay, by his mouth being wide open and he's looking, hey, what's happening? What's happening, man? Uh, let me tell you something. We are going to have a great time. <laughs> okay, so like a fun-loving, yeah. out there, wild guy, kind of like... Um, J.J. Uh, Walker from Good Times, but more of like a modern spin, more of a little <laughs> bit of a rap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna try this character here. How would you begin to build on this character? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, seeing what it is, I would, I would tend to think, oh well, I'm such a cute little fairy little critter. Uh, hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm so glad that you know you can come and see me. <laughs> it's great today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so soft, innocent, yeah. cuddly, playful. Okay, I like that. That's great. Okay, next one. Here we go. How would you start to build on this character right He's wise and learned. There's two forks in the road. You can take this road here, or you can take that one. But whatever road you take, you will come to a conclusion. It all comes from your heart and how you feel about what you're doing. Okay, great. So like a wise, all-knowing, yes. sort of a 
almost like a god. Yes. Like, but a, but a, but a, in, in the flesh. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Next one here. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Uh... Hey, fellas, <laughs> we're going to have a great time, you know, we're out here, you know, at Coachella, and we're chilling out, baby. Hey, hey, get me one of those beers. Come on, dudes. <laughs> okay, so like a fun-loving, creative, yeah. uh, you know, wild ideas, but super smart kind of guy. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Great, and... Oh, <laughs> Let me say one thing here. I really, really, really am happy that you invited me here. <laughs> you know, you guys, <laughs> you you guys are really great. I mean, really, you know, you're the best. You you really are the best. Okay, fun loving, goofy, maybe. A little naive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. And. Remember, the force is with you. You can do whatever you want to do if you believe in yourself. I'm here to be your spiritual guide and help you in any way I can. Great. I don't think there's any, I mean, everybody knows what this character is, and so that right. sounds like him. Okay. Um, what allows you to get into these characters? Well, it depends, you know, like what you showed me was pictures. So, by having experience, I do animations, you know, some, periodically. Uh, they tend to show you the picture of the character and they give you a description of what the scene is or what's happening or what he's gone through. So that shapes your voice. Now, the pictures you showed me, I was able to, or I think I was able to convey what that person was like just based upon what they looked like. Okay, when, you, uh, when you're doing a character without that type of visual or where you have to totally create it yourself, then you have to go into your, uh, I, 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 I hate to call it bag of tricks, but that's what it becomes after a few years. Um, you tend to uh, put yourself in that situation as far as what you've gone through, or if, if say for example, if um, someone in the scene, <clears throat> someone in the scene, or someone had died or something, and you're in a scene, you have to really much, pretty much use your own life experiences. Whereas, um, I was taught years ago how to cry on command, and. Um, there's certain things I would think of. And, uh... Oh. I didn't mean to upset you, Romeo. I'm sorry. I'm not upset. I'm just showing you how to do it. <laughs> I'm almost in tears. Because I thought of a certain thing, and I won't share what I thought of, but as you probably, I got tears welling up. It's just knowing, like I say, we don't like to call it that, but it's what it is, a bag of tricks. And when I first got into business, my, my, my first teacher and my mentor at that point told me, he says, oh, it's so wonderful that you're so new and so raw at this, because you haven't had it. You haven't had the time to develop a bag of tricks. And I'm like, what? He says, no, it's something that will come to you as you gain experience. And I've gained those bags of tricks, you know. You gain that. And, and people that are new in it are like, huh? Like I was like, huh? So what I just did was I just, 
you know, use one of my tricks in the bag. Because, like, when you get on a set, they don't want to have to. I'm sweating here. They don't want to have to. See, I started crying and everything, and you got me in here <laughs> crying and weeping and everything. I started sweating, you know. But, you don't. Um, when you get on a set, they don't have time to put glycerin and all that in your eyes. And see, I wear contact lenses, so I'm not going to let nobody put no glycerin in none of that in my eyes anyway. Because, you know, that, that could hurt me with my lenses. So you have, to, you have to know how to do certain things. I took, a, I took a class years ago when I got to town here where the exercise was to cry on command. And you literally couldn't graduate to the next level in this particular, it was Meisner, you know, Meisner is, I, I love Messi, I've studied every technique, every last one. And my favorite one is Meisner simply because it's an interaction like when you're in a scene or like in life, you and I are talking, I'm talking to you. And I'm reacting off of what you say and how you look. If I say something to you and you get upset, I'm like, oh, I, I hope I didn't upset you, you know. Just based on that, it's not me having to go so far underneath to say, I'm so sorry that I upset you. That's not necessary. That's not real. What's real is like, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't. I hope I didn't offend you. It's just real. So I mean, you learn all that kind of stuff, you know. So um, the business, the, it's it's just great to be able to do all these things. But like I say, you learn techniques. You learn, like I said, you have a bag of tricks, and and experienced actors, you know, will say, oh, "There's no bag of yeah, they are. You you got." Stuff you know how to do when you need it. And like I say, when you're on that set and they say, okay, I need you, you gotta be emotional, you gotta be in tears, you gotta do this, you gotta know what to do to turn it on. Because you're there to turn it on, you, you're hired for that. And if you can't do it, you're out of there. See, because you thought you had upset me and had me crying. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's stuff you learn over the years, you know. And you know, I can be angry. I, I can have things that I think of that make me want to kill you. I'll, I'll tear your ass up. What are you talking about? Who you think you're talking to? You, you get what I'm saying? So it's just stuff you do. And I scare people like that when I do stuff like that because I get into it, you know. You know, it's just being, just being experienced and, and being able to use and, and recall things in your life. Because you know, there's been points where you've been angry, you've lost people, it's part of life. And you've been happy, you know, you've dated or done something like, man, I can't, wow, I can't believe, you know, uh, she likes me, man. <laughs> wow, I, what made her wanna pick me? You get what I'm saying? It's that wonderment in the wide eye, like, wow, man. Whew. She actually, <laughs> I, I thought I was going to be able to say something clever to her, but I, she laughed at me. And then once I got her laughing, then <laughs> we, we got along. And now, you know, we, we're dating now, you know. You, you know what I'm saying? It's just that, na you know, that naivete thing, you know. The young guy is like, wow, in wonderment about that. What, you know, where you learn that if a woman or a man or whatever likes you, you don't have to say anything clever. They just like you. You know, and when people are attracted to you, you can say something out of the phone book and they're like, oh, you know, if they like you. You can be the most suave, debonair guy in the world, you know, and hey, my baby, hey, baby come here, let me explain something. And she would say, get away from me. You're a creep. You get what I'm saying? So it, all, it just depends on all those things. And as you can see, I can't play that type of uh, sleazy kind of kind of guy like that, you know, because I've unfortunately had points in my life where I've been that. <laughs> you, you got all of this in you, you know. You got everything in you, you know. <laughs> it's, it's all in there. Rumi, we love having you here. We love your stories. 
What makes you great at telling stories? I come from a long line of storytellers. Um, my grandfather, I got, I got, I got my grandfather's personality, which my mother, I, I got my mother's personality, which came from her father. But one of my uncles, um, he's, he's, he's been gone a while. He was always the one in the family that was like the one that was telling stories. And then as a kid, I always, you know, was, um, <laughs> I always, I was always just telling stories and just talking trash, you know. <laughs> always, you know, was just my personality, you know. And then the fact that um, I've had a, a lot of experience in a lot of things. I've been shot at. I've been stabbed. And all kind of things, you know. So if people ask me about those things, I'm able to, I'm able to speak and, and I'm able to speak in pictures and make people visualize what I'm saying, you know. And not a lot of people can do that. And it's not anything that I'm, I'm just so gifted at or anything. It's just something natural in me, you know. And, um, and my sense of humor, and, and I must say, if I'm going to say anything about myself where I'm bragging, I have excellent timing. Yes, that is true. I have excellent timing. And I had, I've had people through the years, directors and all kind of people say, your timing is excellent. And that's just something that I've always had. And I, and I mentioned a star from way, way back who had that, Jack Benny. Okay. Jack Benny had the most impeccable timing. Bob Hope. Yeah. Excellent timing. And that's something that I think you either have it or you don't. I mean, you can develop so much of that, but you either have it or you don't. Because I have friends that are excellent, excellent actors. I mean, brilliant. And can't tell a story, can't really do comedic work like that because they don't have the timing. They, they tend to skew more towards dramatic, and they are excellent actors. And did you always have it? To me, it seems like you you you're okay. You 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 don't fear judgment, so that you're okay being you and you're okay telling a story, no matter how outlandish. Did you always have this? Well, yeah, I think I've always had it. But see, like most people in life, anyway, coming up as kids, they teased you. Everybody got teased about something. And, and I tended to find that my sense of humor and the fact that I was able to tell stories made them like me and, and tease me less. <laughs> you know, because you know, every kid gets teased. I mean, all of us. It's something, kids are so honest to a fault. When we get to be grown, we think same thing, but we know through manners and etiquette, not to say things, or we try not to. I know adults that uh, are, are totally obnoxious because they have not learned to filter themselves from their childhood. People tend to, you know, not grow out of that childhood thing of wanting to point something out or about you that's wrong, and look at you, you, you know, no, no, no. Well, it's a way to take someone's power away, too. Right. And then you get this upper hand. So it's also, I think people do it and they say, well, I'm just, I have no filter. What about it? But I think they know that they're going to wound somebody or they're oh, going to yeah. get one over yeah. on them. Yeah. Well, you see, I've never, I've never been that type of person or intentionally been that type of person. But um, I've, like I said, about being a storyteller, I've, I've always, you know, I've always done that. I mean, you know, as a kid, we played the dozens, you know. Which, which were being an athlete, especially being an athlete, locker, locker room humor, you know. Oh, okay, okay. Telling jokes and talking trash and talking silly and everything. I grew up in that. I played sports from like, you know, nine, ten years old all the way through college. You know, I played all the way through. So you end up, you, end up, you know, um, learning and having a facility for things like that. You know, and then it's just about just 
being able to observe. I'm a very observant person. I mean, people don't think I am because a lot of times I'm just either, you know, sleep or I'm not paying attention. They, they think. But I, I don't miss anything. And being an actor, you can't miss anything. You have to observe. And I, and I, and I took a workshop years ago, and they had, a, they, had a, um, they had an interview with Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep is the foremost actor to me. I mean, and there's, of course, many, many great actors. But I found that Meryl Streep, in the workshop I was in, she was in a scene with a guy, and she saw something and picked up a blade of grass and did this as she was doing the scene, which whether she did it purposely or whatever through her technique or whatever, it just shifted all the focus from the other person in the scene to her as she talked about something totally unrelated to the blade of grass. It forced that. Spencer Tracy, I found in a workshop, they had a thing about Spencer Tracy, one of the greatest actors of all time. Spencer Tracy did a scene with a guy and he had his head down like this and he delivered his lines like this and the actor was standing over him. Okay, you would assume that the actor standing over him was in more of a powerful position by him being in a more dominant position. When you're seated, that's not dominant as when you're standing over somebody. That's a dominant position. But Spencer Tracy did this and delivered his lines. like had a hat on and did his lines like this. And the other actor who talked about it laughed. He says, that son of a gun stole the scene. I'm working and doing this, and he's like this, and he stole the scene. And you're not trying to steal, but it's just knowing your stuff, you know. And like I say, Meryl Streep, Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando might be the greatest actor to me, possibly of all time. And when he did uh, Streetcar, uh, no, 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 not that one, but he did On the Waterfront. You seen one On the Waterfront? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The scene with Eva Marie Saint, where he has the glove. He takes her glove. And, and he's doing this and messing with her glove, and he's putting the glove like this on. And he's in the scene with her, and she talked about it. Years later, she says, here I am, this beautiful, beautiful woman in a scene. It's a romantic scene, but he's doing this with the glove. And symbolically, what it meant was they're going to fit together. See, it's things like that, you know, that I don't use all the time. <laughs> I try to use them, but a lot of times they don't come to you. But it's just little things like that that, 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 that take you beyond just being a regular person, or even when you're telling the story, you know, you like, you know, you're doing this and, you know, you take a moment and people are just like, you know, it's just that kind of thing, you know. Right. What are the fundamentals of telling a good story? Okay, having a beginning, a middle, and an end, and knowing when to shut up. <laughs> That's it. That's, that's really it. Can you tell with certain audiences that you should cut it short or keep going? I know you talked about walking into a room of an audition. Sometimes you can tell automatically they love you, oh, vice yeah. versa. Well, um, you you gotta you got you 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 could you know it's it's a psychic connection or whatever. You can feel people. You know you can feel you can you can feel when somebody doesn't like you even if they don't say anything. You could just feel it, even if they're not doing this or anything. They could even be smiling at you like this, and you could still pick up that something intuitive or psychic or whatever, you could pick it up. Then, like I say, you can walk into a room where people are sitting back like this, and they love you, as opposed to, hey, hi, hey, got you, oh, they don't like you at all. What makes a story unsatisfying? When you say unsatisfying, you mean like... Um, well, maybe the, the listener will tune out. Maybe it's just not, um, it's not grabbing people and you can tell you're losing your audience. Well, that's pr what the problem is, is the story is not satisfying. <laughs> what you're talking about is not 
of interest or you're not conveying it well. And it's usually a combination of the two. They don't want to hear what you're saying because they're not interested in it and you're not bringing it across. So, and that happens a lot of times when you audition for stuff where you got a script where, you know, you're saying the words, but you're not connecting to it. See, when you connect to something, then you're able to bring something to it and, and able to have the audience connect to you when you're connected to the material. Sometimes you're not connected because you're just not feeling it or you just don't understand the material. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> or you just, you know, it's just one of those things. Why is it a good thing to be fired from your job? Why is it a good thing to be fired? <laughs> I don't think it's a good thing to be fired. But, <laughs> but usually when you get fired from a job, it's because you don't want to be there. That's usually what it is. Because subconsciously or consciously, you do things to get yourself fired. I mean, I got fired from my paper route at 12 because it kept me from playing Little League Baseball. When all my friends were playing baseball, I'm out there, you know, dropping papers on somebody's front porch. So you tend to do things that force you to get fired, like you have some of the younger kids, you know, from your neighborhood go with you on your paper route and you lay on your wagon and you have them deliver your papers, drop it off at that house, take it over to that house. And of course, some of your customers don't like how you do that and that they don't think that's nice to do that to the young kids, you know. So they call your manager of the uh, paper station. He gets in his car and he comes to your route and he sees you and he blows the horn and you look up and it's him. Oh, Mr. McGowan. And he says, bring your wagon and bring your papers when you're done. Come back to the paper station. I need to talk to you. So it's like, uh-oh. So you go back to the paper station and you get fired. So the shame of it, you don't want to go home and tell your mom and dad that you've been fired. So what you do is you, for the next week and a half almost, you leave the house with your little wagon as if you're going to deliver your, go get your papers and deliver your papers and you go sit up on the playground at your school and, you know, wait the hour, two hours that you normally do your route and you come back home. Now the problem with that is as a 12 year old, you don't think as far as uh, it might rain and then your father comes home early from work to help you deliver your papers because your mother's like, Eddie, it's raining, I don't want him out there, he'll get you bad cold. Drive him to go deliver it. And there was a few times my dad would do that, you know, you know. And so this particular day when it rains cats and dogs out there, you know, my dad says, come on, let's go get your papers and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to do your route, you know, everything. And I'm like, uh, 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 uh. So, you know, kids, especially little boys, have a tendency when they're caught in something to do one of these and, like, look up, you know. Because right now I'm, I'm 12 years old. And uh, my dad is like, okay, what's going on? What, what happened? I... Don't tell me. You got fired. I'm like, yeah. He says, what do you mean? You've been leaving. And my mother says, wait, you've been leaving out of the house every day for almost two weeks. Where were you going? I was going to the playground and I'll sit there. And she says, you would sit there for what, two hours and come home? I'm like, yeah. And my father looked and he says, he told my mother, he says, we're going to be stuck with this kid for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> they were never going to get rid of me. <laughs> I was a misfit. <laughs> and that was the beginning of all these jobs I got fired from. <laughs> I got fired. I got fired from jobs. I had a job where, you know, my boss says, where the hell have you been? I said, don't worry about it. I quit. He says, <laughs> you quit? I said, yeah, I quit. And he was like, Ugh. I said, I got fired from a job. I was a claims adjuster for Aetna Life Insurance. They took me, sent me to school for it. I know all of this stuff, so if you get in an accident or anything, I can tell you how to get money or whatever and uh, how to settle your claim. And 
I couldn't do the job because I was like, I can't do this. That was at that point where I was making the transition into being an actor. And I had a job in corporate America, every day suit and tie and everything. And I, um, I couldn't go after, it was after, and I worked on the job for over a year. And finally I was like, oh, I can't do this. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, I'm ready to branch out and get out of this, this body here and do what I want to do. So I just didn't show up and I used, a friend of mine was into the metaphysics at that point. So he said, you know what you need to do is you need to put this Egyptian pyramid medallion on and it'll lead you to where you're supposed to be. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever excuse I need. So I wore this medallion for about three days and I was like this and I didn't go to the job. And when I walked in there and my boss was like, where are you? And I'm like, man, I quit. And they took me all the way up, because they had trained me. They spent a lot of money to train you. And they took me all the way up each floor to the different, the superintendent, the vice president, the senior vice president, the president. They took me all the way up to chain of command to try to figure out, well, why are you leaving? And I'm in here with all of these executives, and I'm like being interrogated. And they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going into show business. I said it just like that. And they like, what? I said, that's where I'm supposed to be. And I left, and the girl I was in love with dumped me, dumped me, and told me, she said, you're gonna be a bum. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, I'm glad that you know you've uh, decided to get rid of me because obviously, you don't know me and you've never known me. If you knew me, you would know that I'm not supposed to be doing this job over here. I'm an artist, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be doing this over here. So you, she did me a favor. That's true. And <laughs> she's seen me, I know she's seen me over the years on TV and all that kind of stuff. Because I've done quite a few big, big commercials. Yes, you have. And I know she's seen me, and I know. And it's that, it's that thing in you, that human thing in you of like, <laughs> how do you like me now? You know, that thing, you, everybody gets that. It's like, okay, it's almost like, a, it's almost like a form of revenge or something. It's like, see, I turn out not to be the bum that you thought I was going to be. See? And that's what happens to you. And so you end up, you know, you, you got to go where you got to go where you're supposed to be. And I always say this and I say this to people. I say, look, you're going to end up being and doing whatever it is you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, some people end up in prison. <laughs> some people were murderers. Some people get killed. I've, I lost a girlfriend like that who was murdered. And it's, it's, and I found out she was murdered by accident when I called her house. I'd moved away, you know, and I called her house and her brother answered her phone. And I said, go right there and she's no longer with us. I'm like, oh, well, uh, where, where'd she move? Uh, you have a, can I get her number? And he broke down and started crying and said his sister was murdered. I was devastated because not only was she a, a, a girl, ex-girlfriend, but she was a friend. And see, that devastated me. I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh, I broke down. And he cried and I cried. I was like, oh. So, you know, getting back to being an actor and having these things and being able to convey certain things, you have to have a certain amount of courage in this business. I don't care what anybody say. You have to have the courage to recall moments in your life that have really devastated you. And you, you can't be afraid to show that. Because, you know, this is just part of it. It's part of life. 
and and when an actor can convey these things, it touches people because what it touches is that person's life and what's happened to them and what they've seen in their lives. That's 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 what comes across. That's what makes an actor convincing. Not the fact that they're so handsome or she's so beautiful or they're famous or whatever. We got tons and tons of beautiful, famous people that are making millions of dollars that are awful. They, they've some way or somehow have gotten an opportunity, I'm, more power to them, nepotism or favoritism or whatever. Hey, whatever it is and however you got there, that's your business. But to be a real actor, you have to be able to convey your life experiences in a way that people can, can relate to that, you know? And it all comes through the words of the script. You have to be able to do that. Sometimes you can't do it. I mean, I've had auditions and <laughs> some recently where the material was not good and it was hard for me to really get myself going on it. Then I've had stuff where it was just beautiful writing and all you had to do was just say the words and it just flowed because you could relate to it. You know, it's, it's, there was a book years ago called The Courage to Create. I don't know if you've heard of it, maybe you've heard of that book. No, I'll look it up. But yeah, it's, it's, it was a book about, create, about creative people and, and what, what creative people go through to create whatever magic that is, whether they're singing, acting, whatever it is. It's the courage to be able to create. And it takes a lot of courage to create because you have to be able to draw on your experiences. That's why, that's why a lot of the young, young immature actors and young inexperienced actors, they don't expect much from them because they haven't had the life experiences. I've worked with some young actors, and um, <laughs> I, I had a director tell me uh, once, he said, um, can, you, can you help her? And I'm not one to want to, I'm, I know my place, and I know what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do. So I'm one of the last people that will tell you it. I would never say, you know, you ought, you ought to do this and we're in the scene. No, 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 no. I'm not going to say anything because that's not my job. And then I don't, I don't, I find that I would, that would be offending you, trying to tell you what you need to do. But in this particular situation, the director wanted me from my life experiences to help this person because they were supposed to have had experienced that in that particular scene themselves. And they were at a point in their life where they hadn't experienced that. And the director was not able to convey that to them, to, to, to explain what they wanted. Because probably that director hadn't experienced it either. See, it's one thing when you know you start out like I did as one of the young actors and you like no experience to the point where now you're a seasoned old guy. <laughs> where now, you know, people look at you and say, you've been through a lot. Can you help her? And I was able to help her as best I could. And basically, you know, I, I said to her, I said, have you, have you ever lost anybody close to you in your family or, in, or friend or anything? She said, oh, yeah, I have. I said, how did that make you feel? Well, I felt like this. I said, okay, imagine that that's what happened in this scene here, that whatever that particular thing, imagine that. And let's, let's just talk through it. I said, don't act, just talk to me. Use the words, well first let's not even use the words, let's just talk. And then after that I said, okay, can you use the script now? Okay. I've had people try to get me to direct. But I haven't done it because I, I could do it. I've done it before. But I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I don't, I, I don't want to do that. I, I just want to do what I need to do. 
And when I'm when I'm when I'm not on set or I'm not working, I watch sports. I, I tend to watch, and I have friends that get on me. They say you don't watch any of the new shows. I I watch a lot of the older movies and a lot of stuff like that. I watch Brando. I watch all of the great actors. And I and I and I so, told a friend of mine recently. I said, Why would I watch somebody? that I know is not good at this, I said, I don't need to pick up those bad habits like that. I don't need to watch that. I want to watch, I want to watch Brando. I want to watch, uh, uh, I just saw The Godfather. I've seen it about a million times. I want to watch Al Pacino. I want to watch Marlon Brando. The scene in, in The Godfather with a cat. He's talking, he's talking basically murder about the guy, you know, at the studio, they won't give Johnny Fontaine the part. He says, uh, make him an offer he can't refuse. Basically, it's like, uh, kill him if you have to. But the cat, and the cat was a cat from the set that, wasn't, that fell in love with Marlon Brando and got on his lap. And Francis Ford said, oh, get to, he said, oh, no, 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 oh, what are you doing? And he sat there in that, and he's stroking the cat, and... He's he's showing love to the cat, but he's talking about killing the guy if he has to, right? That's the kind of stuff that you know you're not seeing in a lot of, a lot of the new work because everything is so regimented and oh well, do this, do that. You got to work this stuff. Like I say, Meryl Streep with the blade of grass, Marlon Brando with the glove, you know, with with Eva Marie Saint, you know, he's romancing her, but he's like, yeah, you know. Yeah, you, I see you over there at such and such, you know, I see you, you know, you think you really got it going on, don't you? She's like, what do you mean? He says, <laughs> and flirting with her and, you know, getting her like, which was intriguing to her because she's not used to a guy that's talking to her like that. She used to guys say, hey, baby. He's like, yeah, you, you're pretty. Yeah, you know, you, you know how you was doing her. And she was immediately just smitten with him, right? Because it's like, Wow. It's just stuff like that, that you got to bring this stuff. That, that your great actors, your Streeps, Jack Nicholson, uh, Denzel Washington, James Earl Jones, um, uh, 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 all of the greats, you know. Sally Field is a tremendous actor. Started out as the flying nun. Or Gidget too, right? Yes. Gidget. Okay. I, either she was either Gidget first or the Flying Nun. Right. Okay. I'm old enough to remember those actually being on, not in reruns. And she was that, and turned out to be Norma Ray. I mean, brilliant. Forrest's mom. And and screwed herself up by you know getting up there, getting the Oscar. You like me? You really like me? And they were like, and see Hollywood people are weird like that. They like, why would she say that? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's like you know, hey. Tom Cruise, he, he almost screwed himself up on Oprah, jumped on the couch. It, he couldn't work for, what, a couple of years after that. Or they, people were like, ugh. You know, he came back, but it's just weird stuff. And in this business, it's weird. This is a weird, weird business. So anybody watching this, it's weird. And you gotta be kind of weird to be in this. I mean, for a long time, I was like, I'm not weird. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. You got to be. You got to be. And that's part of being an artist, like getting back to what you're saying about being an artist. You, got to, you have to feel this stuff, and you have, to, you have to live it. You have to live it. And that's the thing about it. it. It's just so much to it. It's not just about looking at a script. It's about reading the lines, but it's about being in the scene, being in it, being, being a part of that. Knowing who you are and, and being able to have the courage to express that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's all of that. Why do athletes make great actors? Well, some do and some don't. <laughs> what I think it is, is you're used to competing. As an actor, I mean, as, a, as, a, as an athlete, it's about competition. You're competing whether you're competing one of 11 guys on the football team on offense or one of the 11 guys on defense, or you're running track and you're an individual, or you're running a relay where they hand you the baton. It's competition. 
And those are all of those things are part of being an actor too. An actor is like an actor is an athlete basically too. Because the relay is part of being an actor where I have to hand something off to you or hand the scene off to you or relate to you. Or if I'm individual where I'm on stage doing a monologue, like a runner by themselves. Or, you know, I'm in, in some situation where, you know, we're having a dual track meet. <laughs> I use that example where you have to get points for the team. The same thing as far as being on stage or being in, in a film or whatever. It's a collective. And actors, act, uh, athletes tend to be able to maneuver the business not, that, not because they're better than, than people that aren't a- athletes, but like I said earlier, you accept defeat easier because you're not going to get, you're not going to get 99% of the stuff you go for. And in sports, you're not going to win all the time. I mean, unless, you know, if, like you Usain Bolt or somebody, you know, whatever, you know, but that's rare. That's rare. So you're able to do that. And like I say, that's why I think, like I was saying earlier, why a lot of my actor friends or former actor, former actor friends that aren't in the business now who had been coddled and had done a certain thing can't make it in the industry. Even in athletics, a lot of the young guys that are coddled all the way up in basketball, football, whatever, a lot of them don't make it because they can't handle the, the rejection and frustration once they get into the arena. A lot of them can. It's the same with acting. So when somebody like me that did it as a kid and got away and came back and was basically forced into it because couldn't do anything else, you tend to be able to handle all of these different things. Like I said, oh, at the beginning, I, I couldn't handle the rejection. I'm like, oh, and my, my mentor was like, dude, you're not going to get hardly none of this stuff. I mean, voiceover-wise, I've done this week, I think I've done 10 voiceover jobs, auditions. Guess how many I got? Zilch. It's not a thing. Oh, now, don't think that I'm like, oh, that's okay. No, no, I'm not. But I'm able to just say, okay, moving on to the next one. You got to be able to do that. You got to be able to do that. I played sports and I dropped it. I was one of the fastest guys out there. Got wide open. The quarterback threw a long pass. Now, you got a stadium full of family and friends and all kind of people. Oh. (laughs) There's nothing like that. It's like, ah. I've been in plays who have gone up for whatever reason. I couldn't remember the line. And the person in the scene is looking at me. And if they are an experienced actor, they'll throw me a line or they're smart enough to carry the scene on. But a lot of times these people are, Ooh, and you both up there looking stupid. I've been there. I was in a scene with a guy who, we did, we did a, 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 a one act play where we had to do a dream sequence where we all playing cards and both, both sequences were dream sequences where we were playing cards. And the other actors that were coming into the scene off stage had to react to the cues. He decided, instead of doing the scene in the first dream sequence, he made a mistake and did the lines for the second one. So the actors that were not supposed to come in until the second scene, you could hear them backstage scrambling 
So myself and another guy who is a very prominent actor now, we said, okay, we have to get him back on track. So we went back to the first scene, improv the point, and he's up there, you know, like looking around, and I'm looking at this guy, and I'm saying, okay, without me saying anything, I didn't, I've gone back to not let the audience know. I'm, I'm, I'm rewriting the scene to get him back. And he's still like, ah, la, 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 la. <laughs> it happens, <laughs> you know. And that's one of the things I love about live theater. Oh, I love it. It's like, uh, you know, to go up, you know. I did stand-up comedy. I tried. I, I, can't, I couldn't do it because I just couldn't handle the pre-show before you get up on stage. I couldn't handle that. That's why a lot of comics, they drink or they do drugs because it's not, it's not when you're on the stage, it's before you get up there. And, and see, I took, I took a couple of classes here years ago to do stand-up. <clears throat> and we did, we did the show, and my teachers talked about, he said, um, if, you, if you bomb or whatever, you know how to handle that. And he even had to say, even though I'm telling you how to handle bombing when you don't get any laughs or whatever, you still have to experience that. I can't tell you what that is until you do it. And my situation was I bombed. And the audience is like looking, and you, they know you You know when somebody bombs. And so what I did was what I naturally do as far as me. I said, I'm bombing up here, aren't I? And the audience laughed. And I started talking about that. I started saying, I always wondered what it was going to be like to get up here and have y'all motherfuckers, excuse my French, up here watching me bomb. And the audience fell out. And my material I had was gone. And for the rest of my time up there, I talked about, I said, now nah, my hands and my palms were sweating. And I said, blah, blah, blah. you know, I started doing all of that. And when I left that stage, they were like, and when we went back to the class, my teacher said, you are natural. I said, well, I, I bombed. He says, yeah, but you were funnier after you bombed and you told the audience. He says, do you know what it took for you to just come out and say that? I said, I didn't have any choice. I, said, I was awful. <laughs> I had to talk about it. <laughs> but it's just stuff like that, you know, which, which, uh, which I think is part of what I love about this business. I love it. Because, you know, no performance, even live or whatever, or take film-wise, nothing is ever the same. No, no, okay, take one. Can you do that again? We're gonna, we had a lighting problem here, uh, or, the, uh, uh, or, you know, the reflector, or whatever, the, you know, technical. Uh, just do exactly what you did before, you know. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> You know, you do, you try, but it's, it's different. Romine, would you say that success is not free and it comes with a price? Okay, yeah, but see, a lot of times people like saying, well, you're not successful, you're, you're not uh, starring in, in an A-list movie, you're not in the Avengers. Success is relative. You can be successful by just, you know, being able to get on the stage or get, get, get in an audition and do a good audition. But it does come with a price. Everything comes with a price. No matter what you do, whether you're an actor or a plumber or whatever, there's always gonna be something in your life that's gonna, you know, be a challenge to you. And success, most people don't have, most people have a problem not with success, well, no, no, let me say that again. Most people have a problem with success as opposed to failure. Because most people expect to fail. But a lot of that, not, most people don't expect to succeed. Most people can, that's why, that's why a lot of actors can't handle success. They can't handle it. Because first of all, they weren't expecting to succeed and have success. And then once they got it, it didn't come or it didn't, they didn't react to it 
or it wasn't like they thought it was going to be. I'm successful now and um, I, can, I can do these things. Okay, yeah, you're successful, but you're still lonely, depending on who you are. You still have problems with your wife or your husband or whoever, a girlfriend or whoever, boyfriend. You still have these things. You still have other things going on in your life, no matter whether you're successful or not. You still have money problems because the more money you make, the more people want your money and the more you're going to spend. Success, success is, is not an easy thing. And, it, and to me, it's, more, it's, it's not easy just because It's hard to deal with. It's, it, you, you're not expecting it for one, and then it's hard to handle. It's hard to handle, and and that's 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 what that's what uh, that's what di differentiates the the people that can handle success and are able to keep moving on, and the people that fall by the wayside. I mean. I, I don't even want to mention some of these actors we know that have become successful and completely went off the rack, or just went right off the track because they just had expectations about it and either it didn't happen the way they thought it was going to be once they achieved success or they tripped out all the way because they're successful. And then they end up out nowhere. Under the freeways, you got a ton of people in, in, in refrigerator boxes and in, in tents that were successful people at one point. I had an experience in Chicago where I was in, 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 a, in, in Grant Park, if you've ever been in Chicago, Grant Park. And I was working on a, working on a scene for, a, for an audition. And a man came and sat on, on, on the little bench towards the end down there. And I looked at him, I'm like, oh, okay. And I started listening to what he was talking about. This man was talking uh, uh, scientific equations and, and calculus and, and, and whatever, engineering. He, he was talking and, and babbling in talking that kind of thing. And I was like, he wasn't just saying blah, 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 blah. He was, he was talking about, I knew that the, the, the system and, and, the, and the specifications, and he was gone. And I was like, wow. <laughs> you never know what people are, have gone through or are going through, whether they're successful or not. You never know. It's like, wow. That's pretty deep. I mean, to hear this man just a, a, a bum and just hear what he's talking about in, in, his, in his delirium, you know, it's like, wow. So at that point, I'm like, <laughs> careful, dude. <laughs> you know, careful. <laughs> Don't get out over your skis now. Don't. Don't let your ego take you out. See, a lot of times success, what happens with, with success, the ego takes over. And it happens to everybody to a point. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, I haven't tripped out on some things before in my life. No, we all have tripped out on some things. That's just being human. But, but you got to understand when you trip out, why you're tripping out, and why what you're tripping out over is really not that important, Okay. And you're really not all you think you are at that point. That's why I say in early on, I don't have time to be different than who I am. I'm not. I'm going to be me. You know, it's like, eh, that's boring to me. It's like, well, I'm so, you know, no, get away from me with that. That's why, that's why I like, that's why when I, 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 I get away from this stuff, like after I record, when I get home, I'm taping the draft. He knows I'm into that football. I'm into that. You know, the draft starts tonight. That's, you know, and I'm from Detroit, so my team has not won in 60 years. So the draft is like the Super Bowl. 
Who are we going to pick? <laughs> that's not going to do anything for us. Now, we might be better now. Okay, that's another story. But I get away from this. That's why I, was, I went out with a lady, and we clicked in everything except for the fact that she couldn't turn it off. You got to turn this stuff off. You, you got to turn off everything. You can't, you can't be in work mode 24 hours a day. You got to turn this off. And she was wondering, like, wow, well, we can't seem to, we're not going to. I said, I like you, but you can't turn this off. I don't want to talk shop 24 hours a day. I don't want to be cuddled up talking about, oh, I hope this audition. It's like, oh, stop. <laughs> get away, please. You got to be human. You got to get away from this. That's what destroys people in everything. No matter what you do, it's when you can't let it go and just say, okay, that's this here. Let me be a regular person over here. That's why I dated a woman years ago in Chicago in the medical field. And she, always, she told me one time, she says, now when you get here, please don't let my medical, all these medical people, please don't let my friends start talking and, 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 and you know what you'll do. I said, what will I do? She said, You'll have everybody just phoning over you and everything. I said, because I'm not in the medical field. And they want to talk to somebody that's not doing what they do. She's like, uh, I said, I said, why would a bunch of doctors and people like that want to get to a party and have a guy like me come in there that's not even in it and that have seen me on TV or something? They're going to come to me and say, I saw you on this. What was it like? You know, and I said, oh, well, it's like, you know, I explained that like that. But what it is, is like, you got to get away. And see, being successful is part of that. That's what keeps people grounded. And that's why a lot of people can't make it. Because success destroys them. Everybody can fail. Because in this business, you fail in 99% of the time. So you're used to that. The success is what gets you. That's what gets you. How you handle that? Because at one point, you're going to get something that you're going to be good at and you're going to succeed at. Is how you handle it. And if you can't handle it, you're gone.